Hi guys, Olive here, here today with some very exciting news. I finally finished the 10 most popular books on my TBR project. If you're new around here, this is a project that I started last year. I made a video entitled The 10 Most Popular Books on My TBR, in which I compiled a list of 10 books by looking at the number of Goodreads ratings books on my TBR had. I chose the ones with the highest number of ratings but decided to exclude classics since I already have a classics TBR going. While I have no issue incorporating classics into my reading life, I tend to shy away from popular books. I really don't like hype and I generally relish doing my own thing, but I've started to realize that sometimes my natural inclination to move away from popular books might be robbing me of a potential really great reading experience. So I thought it would be interesting now that I'm at the end of this project to sit down and recap my feelings on these 10 books, but also discuss how I think the project went as a whole. I'm going to start off this discussion by talking about all the books that I had positive experiences with first, and I will save the ones that I had negative experiences with for the end of the video. Two of the books on this list ended up being new favorites of mine, and one of those was The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Sutterfield. This was one that I was nearly positive I was going to enjoy, but I had no idea that I would fall for this book the way that I did. I picked it up fairly early on into this project because Katie from Books and Things decided to do a reread of this book. It's her favorite contemporary novel, and she decided to turn that reread into a community read-along. I thought that was a great opportunity for me to pick up this book that I was intending to read anyway and I am so glad I did so. Reading this as part of a community added so much to the experience. This book is about a famously private yet prolific author, Vita Winter, who invites a literary biographer to her home so that she can finally divulge her very closely guarded life story. This book is so moody and gothic. It makes a really amazing autumn read if you're looking for some options for this fall and haven't yet read this book but it's also one of those bewitching books about books. It's a love letter to stories and the power that they hold, but it also delivers a really thought-provoking message about how that same power that makes stories so beloved can also make them very dangerous tools. I loved this book so much that I immediately pre-ordered her latest book, Once Upon a River, and then once I read that book, I made a very gushy review of it that it entirely deserved. The only book I have left to read of Diane Setterfield's is Bellman in Black, and I'm hoping to do so this year. The other favorite that this project introduced me to is A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. This is a nonfiction work that gives brief glances into many different branches of science, giving you just enough about each to have a background. This book had been on my radar for quite some time. When I was getting back into reading after college, College. I spent a lot of time on the bookish internet in the days before I discovered BookTube. I was a frequent visitor to Book Riot in its earlier days, and I also spent a lot of time in the bookish communities of Reddit. If you've ever been on the subreddit R Books, you'll know that there are a handful of books that are immensely popular with that crowds. I personally don't think the reverence shown for all of those books is warranted, but hey, they have their darlings just like we here on BookTube do. This is one of those books that is nearly universally praised there, so I did have some reservations about how much I was going to like it. Also, my previous two experiences with Bill Bryson's works had some mixed results, but maybe the most off-putting thing about the idea of picking this book up was that I knew this book started off with a discussion of the Big Bang, which I do not understand and don't think I will ever understand. But despite all of these obstacles, this book absolutely charmed me. It is fun, funny, and informative. It makes for a great introduction to all of these different branches of science. And if you're anything like me, it will absolutely spark an interest in further readings. But although not every book I read for this project became a new favorite, there were quite a few that I highly enjoyed, including three four-star books, so still really good. Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides was another book that I harbored really intense fears about reading, mainly because one of his other books, The Marriage Plot, is one of the worst books that I have ever read. But the wonderful Stephanie over at That's What She Read talked me into giving this multi-generational family saga a try, 
mainly because that's her favorite type of book and I trust her taste. This book is all about the history of a Greek family who emigrates to the United States and after a couple of generations eventually our narrator Cal born Calliope is born into the family. Cal is born intersex which is a very rare medical condition in which an individual is born with the reproductive organs of both sexes and this book is marketed as though it has a focus on Cal's journey to his own gender identity. But the vast majority of this book is all about the Stephanides family and with good reason. It's obviously heavily inspired by Jeffrey Eugenides' own family and it's the most well done part of the book. The gender identity issues? Not so much. Another one that I was dreading picking up but that I was actually very pleasantly surprised by was Atonement by Ian McEwan. I was not looking forward to reading this book mainly because I watched the movie as a teenager and it thoroughly messed me up, but I should have anticipated that I was going to love this book as much as I ended up doing because I've enjoyed pretty much all of Ian McEwan's books. This book starts off in the mid-1930s, it moves into the World War II years and then beyond, and it basically follows the devastating impacts of a claim made in the heat of a moment by a 13 year old girl. I thought this was gorgeously written and I've since gone back and rewatched the movie, which I think was brilliantly done. It stays extremely faithful to the book, which I really appreciated. I am glad that I finally read this. Another book that I read for this project that I did really enjoy, albeit while noticing some pretty glaring faults, was the massively popular 1990s work of true crime, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Barrent, which is all about a murder that shook up the deliciously odd community of Savannah, Georgia. There are some truly fantastic elements to this book, but the issue that I ended up having with it was that at the very end, the author admits that he took liberties with the story to make it more entertaining which to me anyway makes it more of a fiction book than a nonfiction book. I actually reviewed that book when I read it late last year and in that same video I compare the book to its movie adaptation. I'll link that down below in case you're interested. Funnily enough there was only one book on this list that I thought for sure was going to earn five stars for me and I was shocked when it didn't. That book was the history slash true crime book The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. It seriously felt like I was the last person on earth who had yet to pick up this book which is not only only about the planning and construction of the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, but is also about a serial killer who was committing his crimes during this same period. I thought the true crime portions of this book were the most interesting. I was kind of let down by the book because I felt like the blurb was promising me a story in which this killer, H.H. Holmes, was using the fair to facilitate his crimes. But no, they're just both in this book because they were happening at the same time. But with so much of this book being about the logistics of planning such a massive event, meanwhile I'm the type of person who gets high V just thinking about planning a birthday party for myself, it just wasn't for me. So those were all of the positive, or at least mainly positive, comments, but the remaining four books that I took on for this project inspired hostility so expect some. First up is Neverwhere by Neil Gaiman. I read this fantasy novel at the beginning of this year and while I really liked how it started off, it quickly dissolved into this weird clashing combo of creepy and cutesy, a combination that one can only describe as spoopy. Pointing to character motivations as the book goes on is nearly impossible because there are really none to speak of and all the magic stuff that's in there, it didn't feel like any of it had a purpose. It's there just because the the author could. Now I know that Neil Gaiman is beloved across the internet and I am so happy for you legitimately if you like his works, but this was not for me in about 50 different ways. And then I ended up feeling very similarly about the book that I just finished a couple of days ago, the last one that I had to read for the project, that was The Magicians by Lev Grossman. Unlike Neverwhere, this is the first part of a fantasy trilogy, but something that they do have in common is this need to appear as something different than what they actually are. Neverwhere is a really dark story with these odd injections of whimsy to make it something light and casual. I don't know if he was trying to make it like black cotton candy or something. The Magicians at its core is about an angsty teen at a magical school. 
That's really all it is. But the author feels the need to try to make it edgy with the inclusion of drugs kind of out of nowhere, and then tries to make it oh so meta with all of these references to Harry Potter, which this series is nearly constantly compared to. I said in my Goodreads review, and I stand by this, that reading this book is about as annoying as hanging out with an actual teenager because it completely lacks self-awareness. I liked some portions in the beginning of this book, but by the end I wanted to rip my hair out. And then the last two books that were on the 10 most popular books on my TBR list I minimally interacted with. The first of those was The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. This book was not keeping my interest a ways into it, and the only emotion that it sparked was annoyance when the author wanted to show me that a character was evil because she was fat. It is someone's actions, not their physical attributes, that ends up defining their character. Not really sure why that needs stating, was not interested in keeping on reading this one. And then the last book on this list I actually ended up getting rid of shortly after making that video. I got rid of it physically and took it off of my Goodreads TBR. I had picked up A Discovery of Witches by Deborah Harkness at a library book sale a couple of years before making that video last year, but after I started receiving some comments on that video about the type of book it was, I decided that it probably wasn't for me considering that paranormal romance isn't normally my thing. I decided to let go of my desire to read that one and I have not regretted that decision. So now that I am standing at the end of this project, how do I think it went? What are my feelings? Well, genuinely I think it went fairly well. I discovered two new favorites, I enjoyed a handful more, and I genuinely feel as though I accomplished something in now being a part of the conversation about all of these books. And I think that's important to mention because I think that's a main motivating factor in why people pick up popular books to begin with. They're the books that everyone's talking about, the books that everyone's read, and they want to be a part of that conversation. They want to know what all the fuss is about. I think people also read popular books because they're the easiest to discover. I think a lot of people who are not super active in the book world struggle to find their next read. And even if they do have an inkling of what books are on the horizon or they go to their bookstore and see all the selections there, they might not know what's worth their time. So the thing that they're going to put trust in is a popular book, a hyped book that a lot of people are affirming is good. And then there's a snowball effect. The more people are reading a book and hyping it up, the more likely it is for other people to join in on that conversation. And the more that they join in on the conversation, the more desirous that other people will become to read that book. And there it goes. <laughs> this isn't a new phenomenon. There's always been a hot thing of the moment when it comes to books and all media, really. So if popular books are so magnetic, why did I have to structure a challenge for myself to convince myself to read more of them? Well, it's partially because of what I mentioned at the beginning of the video, that I like to do my own thing. I like to read books that no one else is talking about, if only because I think those books are often more deserving of the attention. But also, reviewing very popular books has not always gone very well for me as a reviewer. I am someone who likes to give my honest opinion always as respectfully as possible, but the more people have read a book, the more likely I'm going to run into someone who has a real problem with me expressing dissatisfaction with a very well-loved book. I got a lot of pushback when I reviewed Neverwhere earlier this year. There was one conversation that eventually did turn into something at least semi-productive, but it started out with hostility. And I've spoken about this before on this channel, but I think people too easily equate things that they love with themselves. So any criticism of that type of media ends up being a criticism of you. Just because something is popular doesn't mean that it's perfect, and it also doesn't mean that everyone has to like it. I got a comment many years ago on a video that I did saying that a book sold a lot of copies, so obviously it was good. No, that doesn't mean it's good. It means that it's well liked. It's never fun to go against the crowd, and I would much rather love every single book I read, but I think it's really important to give one's honest opinions in the most respectful way possible. But I will freely admit that I regrettably have to keep these types of reactions in mind when I am taking on reviewing a popular book. That's not something that I want to have to do. I want to be able to give my honest opinions and review books the way I want to. And so the way that I feel like I can keep doing that in the way that I want to is to shy away from the popular books. So am I grateful that I took on this project? Yes, absolutely. How could I not be when it introduced me to two new favorites and also a handful of books that I really enjoyed? Would I do it again? No. Does it make me want to shift my focus from the backlist? 
Absolutely not. But it would be really awesome to hear from you in the comment section below. Do you read popular books? If so, what's their appeal? And if you steer clear of them like I do, what's your reasoning? If you have any other general comments or questions, those can also go in the comment section below. But if you'd like to reach me anywhere else on social media, all the links to my profiles are in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching and for coming along with me on this journey for however long you've been following. I hope it's been enjoyable and I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.